please. All right, again, thank you. We're going to bring in, be bringing in more chairs, so uh, no worries. This is going to be a very conversational, uh, discussive type panel, so um, just, just bear with us. Um, today, for the next part of the program, we're going to go to uh, Congress and the Open Internet Order, discuss, uh, is our panel right now. And then uh, just after that, we'll transition to um, Gary Arlen's going to moderate a panel um, called The Strain of Online Videos, How Will Congress and Regu Regulators React, which uh, apparently is pretty timely today, so we're very excited about that. Um, let me just go start going with this particular panel. Uh, as Congressman White said, I'm Tim Lorden. I'm the Executive Director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. Um, I work for Jerry Berman, who um, still wants to get internet access out in West Virginia. Um, and, and um, if he did get really good internet access, I'd probably have uh, uh, more emails from him. But um, <laughs> that said, um, uh, today we're discussing uh, the, the December 21st um, FCC's open internet order. Um, in the past two years, we've had at least um, five or six different panels, both at State of the Net, State of the Mobile Net, and actually within the Capitol Complex. Um, on this issue, uh, Professor Yu is a, a, a regular uh, guest of ours, as is Markham. Um, we're, we're excited that uh, Colin and Larry are, 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 are first timers for the Congressional Internet Caucus program. So, um, you know, with that, I think what we wanted to explore today was what, you know, with regard to the open internet order, the FCC is moving to, to create some rules of the road uh, for the open internet, what is commonly referred to as net neutrality. And the question today is, how will Congress react? What is going to happen as this thing rolls out? Um, as, as you may know, the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee process is very democratic with a lowercase d. We try to get everybody together. Um, we don't claim to be experts on any particular issue, but we try to get experts in that will help us plan these events. And um, a planning uh, program we had in a couple of years ago, uh, we were talking about uh, net neutrality. And, and, and one of the participants in the advisory committee program said, well, this is a FCC issue. The, the Congress has no play here. Um, and having been doing kind of, uh, whether it be forced access, open access, going back to this issue a good 12 years, I kind of always feel that Congress has a, a, a something to play um, in anything that's going on. And, and I was pretty astounded at the statement. But I, w I think in the last six months or the last eight months, we've seen uh, Congress really flex its muscles um, with regard to uh, the net neutrality proceeding and the open internet proceeding. And I think it's fair to say that Congress always has a play. So now, I guess the question is, given the dynamics, given the influx of, of new voices in the United States Congress, uh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen with the open internet order? What's going to happen with Congress moving? We, had, we heard from Marshall Blackburn yesterday and a panel of experts talking about technology and the Tea Party and what that all means. So what I'd like to do is open it up for, for this particular panel um, to, to, to comment on the topic of the panel just for like a minute or two, and then we'll go into question and answer. Uh, so let's start off you, with you, Professor. Um, I think that Congress clearly does have a role here. And in this case, uh, history is, I think, very instructive. Uh, the last time we had a major new communications technology, we had a very similar pattern. It was cable television. And we tried to shoehorn it into a broadcast regime. We had the same sort of ancillary jurisdiction fights. And eventually, what we discovered is just trying to cram square pegs into round holes, or rather, pegs that we didn't know existed into holes that we planned for different technologies just didn't work very well. And we had a congressional fix. And uh, we have Title VI of the Communications Act. And I would expect here, I think that the next move is clearly judicial. There will be a court challenge. There'll be, and as there were you know, with cable, that will all play out. But eventually, uh, we're trying to attach ancillary jurisdiction to regimes written for technologies that didn't exist at the time, that those statutes were written, and however they're going to apply is going to be largely accidental. And I think eventually we're going to get a new uh, legislation. It is appropriate and almost inevitable that Congress will have a role, creating a, role, uh, a new set of rules designed for the Internet from the ground up that will actually yield a better <coughs> policy. Um, I, I neglected to, because you're such a regular, I neglected to introduce you. <laughs> Prof Professor Yu's bio is on the website. Um, he, he is uh, with the University of Pennsylvania Law School Center for Technology, Innovation, and Competition. Um, he has been working on this issue for a long time, and I've been the benefit of one of, one of his seminars. Um, Markham Erickson is with uh, uh, the Open, uh, uh, for today, Markham is with the Open Internet Coalition, which is important who he represents. Um, then we'll go to Larry Downs, who's uh, an author and consultant. Um, his 2009 book, The Laws of Disruption, was very, very well received. And I'm very thrilled to have Colin Kroll uh, from Kroll Strategies. Um, as many of you know, worked for Congressman Markey for many years, and just re more recently uh, worked for Chairman Janikowski at the Federal Communications Commission. And with that, Markham? 
Uh, thank you, and, and thanks uh, everybody for coming this morning and taking some time on this. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm going to probably talk most about the, the substance of the rule and, and highlight a few things because I think Congress does have a very important role to play here. This is not just an FCC issue. Uh, they uh, should and will engage, I think, in vigorous oversight on this, uh, on uh, what the FCC's done. And I, I think that's healthy and, and that's a good thing. And I think for our perspective, uh, you know, there's still some uh, issues that we need to see uh, how they play out, how this rule is enforced, how it's interpreted. Um, and uh, Congress is going to uh, want to uh, monitor that as well. And at some point, uh, I suspect, uh, <coughs> engage in a legislative uh, activity to update the Telecommunications Act. But I think there's some things to take off the table here that the FCC did that are really important, some positive things uh, that we sort of take for granted now, but we didn't at the beginning of the net neutrality debate. Uh, this rule represents the strongest statement to date, supporting the importance and necessity of an open internet for the advancement of technology, innovation, and democratic discourse. And if you remember long ago, at the beginning of this debate, there were some voices that were saying, actually, you know, that openness might not be such a good thing and that maybe the internet needs to develop and change into something that looks quite different from what the internet is today and that would just be the natural evolution of that communications platform. Well, well this rule uh, rejects that notion and it says the vast majority of stakeholders who engage in the process reject that notion. So I think that's an important piece to take, to take off the table from this. Um, it unequivocally rejects the notion that paid prioritization on the internet will spur investment in the communications infrastructure. It talks about a virtuous circle of, of in, innovation and investment and democratic discourse where everybody in the stakeholder community benefits. The ISPs benefit, the consumers benefit, and the application developers benefit because they're all uh, equally incentivized uh, to, to invest in the network, to develop uh, innovative applications, and for consumers to, to buy, uh, uh, to purchase broadband internet access. And these rules are really, I think, sort of a light touch application to try to get those incentives put into the right place. And I think that's an important, um, an important concept. A third concept that I th found was very, very important in this is that it, aff it affirms that there's one internet. And that wasn't really taken for granted in this rulemaking process that that's where the FCC would come out. And despite the fact that they treat mobile platforms differently in the rules than they do fixed wireline platforms, the rules unequivocally state, though, that there's, there's one internet, and that while the rules might apply a little differently now on the access side, they affirm this concept and the importance of one internet, that consumers are going to switch between platforms, uh, a variety of platforms. Um, I'm getting the, uh, the uh, clearing the throat, so I'll, I'll leave it there, and, and maybe we can get into a few other things, but I think those are the things that Congress is going to want to look at. There's all, obviously some issues that I think are maybe not so helpful, and we're going to want to explore those two with Congress. Mr. Downs, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm sort of a pathetic guy. I spent the Christmas holiday reading the report in the order, which is 194 pages. And I, I see Markham's copy here, which is completely covered with post-it notes. Um, I'm suspecting most of you have not read it word for word. Uh, just to sort of give you the, uh, the cliff note version, what you'll probably be hearing a lot about in the next 6 to 12 months would be uh, paragraphs 35, 78, 47, footnote 235, and, and paragraphs 151 through 160, which deal with enforcement. Uh, I suspect these are the ones that will get the most attention uh, from, uh, from Congress and the courts. And I think, you know, my view is, you know, having watched Net Neutrality, certainly nowhere near as long as, uh, as some of you and, and some of the other panelists, but over the last three or four years in particular, uh, what finally came out in the December vote, and you know, we have uh, see, two of the commissioners dissented, uh, two of the other commissioners uh, approved the order but with, uh, with reservations, so we really only had you know, one person, the, the chairman, who was outright enthusiastic about what finally came out. Uh, it was a very long, uh, rancorous, very political process, particularly over the last 12 to 14 months. Obviously there was the, the Comcast court decision in May of last year, which also uh, 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 turned the, uh, the, the course of the debate in a difficult way. And I think, you know, on balance, the way I read the order uh, and the report in the end is this was uh, just an effort by the FCC to uh, punt this down the road. Uh, both to the courts, uh, I think the, the, um, the legal challenges are inevitable, uh, and to Congress, uh, and get it off the plate uh, so that the FCC could move on to some of the other 
and more important issues that we heard about some yesterday in terms of spectrum and universal service reform and intercarrier compensation and some of the other things that have uh, have been uh, distracted uh, in the uh, certainly in the in the net neutrality debate. <coughs> so I suspect that, uh, that that the Congress is going to take a close look uh, at, at uh, those provisions in particular, those sections in particular. Uh, and that uh, certainly the, the, uh, the nature of the uh, FCC's authority to move forward uh, with the order that they did uh, will uh, tie up the courts for at least a couple of years. I hope we'll talk later about, you know, in the, certainly over the course between the October notice of proposed rulemaking and then the final uh, order that uh, happened in December, uh, there were a lot of changes to the text of the original proposed rules. And in the course of the report, you'll see uh, many, many, many new uh, exceptions, exemptions, limits, caveats, and constraints that were added to them. Uh, some of them are the source of unhappiness, both for the, for the pro-neutrality advocates as well as the anti-neutrality advocates. Uh, and I hope we can, we can talk about some of those in detail, because I think they point to a larger problem that uh, became clear to me over the holiday reading this report of, of what's really going on. Colin. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate the uh, invitation. It's, um, Wonderful to be here. Uh, I will uh, quickly agree with uh, many of the things that uh, the fellow panelists uh, said. Uh, of course, Congress has a role. Uh, Congress always has a role. Uh, Congress has spoken to these issues uh, in the past. And obviously, uh, if uh, Congress were to uh, come in to refine, clarify, recalibrate the law, that's obviously in their uh, uh, purview. That's the prerogative of Congress. And, uh, you know, many, uh, including myself, would welcome uh, the uh, Congress uh, recalibrating uh, and refining and clarifying uh, many of these rules so that they're uh, crystal clear to uh, the, the public uh, so that we don't have to deal with uh, questions of uh, vagueness uh, about uh, the intent of Congress. Uh, having worked on the Telecom Act of 96, I um, have enjoyed the many years since then with all sorts of people. Um, uh, informing me what Congress intended um, uh, when it passed that. Uh, uh, I do, re I do uh, recall uh, aspects of the, uh, the debate leading up to that. Uh, I joined uh, Congressman Markey's staff in uh, 1989. Uh, when I had joined uh, in 1989, uh, it had already uh, been five years uh, since uh, the breakup of Ma Bell. And that meant it was also five years since the seven baby bells had been agitating uh, to update uh, communications laws and clarify uh, what their roles in the, in the marketplace could be with respect to uh, the consent decree. Uh, notwithstanding that, uh, it was another uh, six years uh, before Congress successfully legislated uh, the Telecom Act of 1996. So I think if we look at Congress uh, getting involved. There are various ways in which Congress can get involved. Uh, oversight is obviously one uh, tried and uh, true way uh, which uh, Congress uh, uh, looks at the, the work of the agency. Um, there are also uh, uh, already uh, discussions about a resolution of disapproval uh, about this particular order and uh, obviously the machinery of both the House and Senate could gear up to do a more major overhaul of communication statutes. I think what we're looking at now is uh, while uh, we wait for Congress to decide whether and to what extent to refine or recalibrate uh, or to overhaul those statutes, uh, what do we have? And so for many years we had a lot of hand-wringing over the fact that since 2005 uh, people were lamenting the fact that we simply had high-minded principles. Uh, that uh, articulated the rights of users and marketplace participants with respect to their internet uh, use. Um, and I think the good thing about what the Commission did uh, in December is now, after a full-blown notice and comment rulemaking, uh, we have rules on the books. Uh, obviously, there'll be a role, as I said, for Congress. Uh, you know, as Larry indicated, uh, and I agree, I think, you know, court challenges are inevitable. Uh, but I think the next question is, is what happens uh, you know, before those pieces uh, fall into place. Okay, well, let me, um, let me just, let's go through at the beginning, let's talk a little bit of politics, then we'll talk a little bit of law, then we'll talk maybe a little bit of process, and then maybe we'll talk um, at the end, like, what's the actual effect if this thing actually goes into effect. But if I can operate from a presumption that 
Um, the Internet, when it was found, the Congressional Internet Caucus, when it was founded in 1996, um, and the advisory committee founded by Jerry Berman and, and Congressman Rick White and others, um, it, there was a sense that the Internet was going to be really important. Um, and that was not widely held at the time. Now, of course, we feel pretty good about what the, the fruit that the Internet has borne. And there, and then, but there are people like Jerry Berman in his opening speech yesterday um, noted that there was something precious about an open internet that has kind of yielded this uh, cornucopia of uh, goodies um, with regard to technology. And I, I want to just, my assumption for this panel is that everybody here feels that this issue is hugely important. Does any, any of the panelists disagree with that, that this is not an important issue? Because I hear around town there's a, there's a fatigue, there's an, uh, you know, why, why do we keep doing this net neutrality thing? Why do we keep doing this open internet order? Does anyone feel like these are not important issues? I'll bite. Um, <laughs> I think uh, that if it, I won't say that they're unimportant. I think that they've probably generated much more attention than they deserve, uh, which isn't to say that they're not important, but that there are other things that are. Uh, equally important, if not more so, that it should have gotten airtime, specifically the National Broadband Plan. Um, the build out of networks and increasing the network the, to West Virginia and increasing competition, frankly, if we were really robust in that, all these issues would go away. We had a vibrant uh, leadership out of the chairman's office, got a serious discussion of spectrum reform for the first time that has largely been overshadowed by the network neutrality debate for the last year. And as you know, Last spring, we had this huge uh, discussion of the National Broadband Plan almost completely disappeared for the last six to nine months. So, and if, and so, if that's the huge cost to me. So uh, too, too much attention on this and, and not enough on other issues and, and you know, taken as a whole, that's not a good thing. That's net loss. I think so. I, I think this, you know, it, 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 I think the fatigue has to do with the, the level of rancor and, and partisan debate over this issue which is unusual in the telecom space. Uh, most telecom issues are, are, are not so partisan. And I think it's really unfortunate because I think as the debate evolved, really the serious stakeholders in the debate had jettisoned the, the rhetoric and, and the partisan uh, take to this and were trying to figure out a solution that would be a win-win a for a lot of stakeholders. Um, I think the next iteration may be, you know, this issue started basically because of broadband, but really the advent of, of video really catapulted, I think, the net neutrality debate. Um, I think the next iteration may be in the middle mile and, and sort of the, the backhaul issues, the, the peering arrangements between companies, and, and hopefully that issue can be looked at in a way that, that doesn't devolve into the, sort of the partisan bickering that, that we've seen in this debate. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask questions of the panelists, but feel free to engage one another um, but, you know, it's, back and forth. It's not just partisanship. I think that we're learning some lessons from the 96 Act, which is we had fights all the way up to the Supreme Court multiple times, and we didn't actually get a sign-off by the courts on the, uh, the Telerik pricing regime, which is the heart of the 96 Act, until 2002, at which point nobody cared. We did that to allow local into long distance, and at that point, long distance was two cents a minute. No one's made money in that business for decades, for years. And so now a throw in on your phone, they don't even charge you for it. Um, I actually think something similar has happened here. This debate really has been going about at least half a dozen years. Um, if you look at the way the markets move past it, the envision of this is uh, that the it was content, web content on your browser. That was the relevant uh, th thing we're purchasing, and the browser was the, uh, the relevant platform. And right now, if you look at the iPhone world, that's not the right model. What we have now is apps, which by definition pre-position content in a privileged way. And the relevant platform is now the wireless OS, or the wireless operating system, and the app store. And we have a world in which apps where you routinely pay for it on a, on a completely different business model in a way that's been fantastically innovative and fantastically successful. And on some level, one of the problems is in six years, the industry has moved past the fight that we're having. And, and much like we have with Telerik, by the time we get some of these things worked out, uh, one of the reasons the steam has gone out of the fight is, is the fundamental focus of the industry has shifted. Well, let me, let me just say, uh, Colin mentioned um, the Telecom Act of 1996. It might have been the Telecom Act of 1994, but it ended up being the Telecom Act of 1996. Um, it was a, you know, an ambitious piece of legislation. There was tons of stuff in it. Um, Telerik pricing, which I can't remember the, what the acronym stands for. I'm sure Professor Yu does. Um, just huge, I mean, for, you, for those of you who were not around at the time, um, just a massive, uh, massive, massively ambitious piece of legislation. Let me ask you this. So there's a question about whether Congress can actually take up the mantle and you know, rewrite the Telecom Act or new, do a new Telecom Act for the Internet age. And I, it strikes me that even something very, very, very modest 
would be very difficult for this Congress and perhaps the next Congress. What was it about 1996 that, you know, did they have just, that Congress have more political will? Uh, what, why, why, were, why was the Congress able to do that in 1996? And, and I, I'm kind of skeptical about its ability to do that today. Well, uh, you know, looking back, I think the reason why Congress was able to successfully legislate in 96 is because at least the House had successfully legislated in 1994, as you mentioned. And so the Telecommunications Act was essentially 20 bills in one. It took successive hearings uh, to uh, get to the point of hammering out the uh, essential compromises and the key provisions. And those hearings were indispensable to the process because uh, you have to educate the members and staff about the implications of changes in the law. You have to educate uh, about the implications of new technologies uh, before you get everybody to a point where they feel uh, comfortable uh, with legislating. Uh, in order to successfully legislate on anything, on any issue, you really have to drive toward consensus on two issues. One, that there's a need to change the law uh, or to pass a new one. Uh, and we had achieved a consensus that the court uh, consent decree breaking up Ma Bell was restricting uh, the seven baby bells from getting into information services, manufacturing, and long distance. There were reasons why the court did that uh, for antitrust reasons. Uh, the 1984 Cable Act had kept the uh, phone companies out of the cable business. And so there was a growing sentiment that that didn't make much sense, that Congress should change uh, uh, communication statutes to take co communications policy making away from the court, away from the judge, um, and instead uh, set a new template for activity in the marketplace. Uh, but driving that consensus uh, uh, to change the law also required us to find consensus on the second piece, uh, which is, uh, uh, the uh, uh, indispensable ingredient to having a Rose Garden signing ceremony, which is you have to have consensus on what the new policy ought to be. And so finding that is often more elusive, um, and finding that often takes successive Congresses. Uh, and that's what we found in 1996. In 96, when, um, you know, Congressman Rick White uh, came in with the, uh, with the new Congress, uh, 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 my old boss, Ed Markey, and Jack Fields in the previous Congress had passed a bill through the Congress dealing with about a third of what would ultimately become the, the Telecom Act of 96. The other two major titles, so to speak, two elements that were added in 95, 96 was uh, the deregulation of cable pricing uh, and cable regulations, and secondly, the uh, deregulation of mass media ownership rules. And so we had to have new fights and new uh, debates about those issues. <coughs> but we were on third base with a lead going into 95, 96 with respect to, yes, the phone company should be in the cable business. Yes, cable and others should be in the local phone business. Uh, that we should unbundle set-top boxes and, and take the Carter phone principles to the cable uh, 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 marketplace. Uh, that we should hook up schools and libraries uh, to the internet. And so we had all of those elements in there, and that's what made it easier in 96. What, what I heard Professor Yu said, and, and which was also very frustrating to me and others uh, from the staff level uh, you know, who had worked on the act, is when you saw the FCC implementation, then the regs go to court, it did take an awfully long time for the court system to come out with uh, its judgment as to whether or not a particular rule was kosher or not. And so I don't know if the next uh, you know, act should also include elements of judicial reform uh, or expedited, <laughs> <laughs> expedited. Uh, as an old Energy and Commerce Committee staffer, I hate to suggest things that would find itself in the Judiciary Committee, but, uh, you know, those are, the, those are aspects of life, uh, you know, when you legislate new statutes. So, so Larry, um, you yeah. know, maybe taking the baseball metaphor, are we at first base, second base, are we even in the stadium? Are we looking <laughs> for uh, a Rose Garden ceremony? What, what is, what's going to happen in Congress? Well, you know, so uh, I have different perspective. I, in 1996, I was working uh, as a consultant for a small German telecom company that was trying to compete with Deutsche Telekom, uh, which was in then still a very, very highly regulated uh, marketplace. 
And my client was, was, was aghast at the passage of the 96 Act. They said, we could never do that in Germany. You're in one stroke of the pen, one signing here. You have now deregulated, you know, it said very clearly that the text made no doubt about it. You've deregulated the phone market. And even as someone who wanted that in Germany, they said, we wouldn't want that to happen overnight. We couldn't possibly uh, respond that quickly. It would be way too uh, chaotic and disruptive. And of course, I laughed at them. Well, obviously, it turned out the joke was on us. <laughs> because what we found was, and, and I don't think this is unique to telecom law, is what, what we learned in school about how laws get made is, you know, after the signing of the president, that's the final step. Well, it turns out that's the first step. Uh, in the American system, the thieves fell out almost immediately. All the people who had worked on the compromise of the 96 Act you know, rushed to the courthouse to file their, their litigation to challenge various aspects of it, including you know, some crazy constitutional claims, a bill of attainder, and so on and so forth. And that is the nature of, of this kind of regulation, particularly for a complex industry, is inevitably the actual legislating gets done in court, uh, which is clearly not the optimal way to do it. Uh, but you know, and, and if, if nothing else, we saw how I think the 96 Act it came when it did because Judge Green was just getting too old and too tired to keep running the industry out of his chambers. <laughs> um, but of course, what the 96 Act did, not intentionally, was to put it right back to the courts for the next several years, certainly, uh, went up to the Supreme Court you know, four or five times in the, in the first five years, just getting past the definition uh, clauses was the problem. Uh, that seems to be the, I don't think judicial reform is, I don't think you saw, take that seriously as a, as a likely candidate. That's what's going to happen. Even if we do pass another major overhaul, uh, you know, we, we know that it will be in the courts for many years afterwards. But I well, think it's too pat to just blame the industry, because I think the, com and the court, the judicial process, I think that the commission has some responsibility here. It took them four tries to issue rules that comply with necessary and compare. A necessary and impair. And the courts kept sending them down. They sort of kept doggedly pushing it back. Whereas if they'd gone back and actually done what the courts had said in the Iowa Utilities Board, it, I think we would have gotten there a lot faster. There was commission you know, uh, stubbornness just to stick with a certain interpretation that kept it prolonged it much longer than it needed to go on. Um, that's really interesting that uh, Colin spent some time talking about um, how the 96 Act came about and, and the consent decree and the break antitrust around Ma Bell. Um, and Larry basically you know, summarized it as, we just had a judge that was just old and tired. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we have the 96 Act. Um, but you know, that said, if, can we get into the, the legal aspects of it and the challenges? Um, uh, I, you know, I, I don't want to give short shift to Congresswoman Blackburn saying there's going to be a congressional hurricane coming, and, and there seems to be a bit of skepticism about whether we can do another telecom act. Um, but let's say, let's say this open ended order goes, th it goes through. Um, what, what are the, what's going to happen to the courts? Um, uh, it's gonna, I suspect it will get litigated. The primary issue is going to be jurisdiction. <coughs> Following the Comcast decision in April, uh, they uh, acknowledged that there is some room for jurisdiction, as did the Supreme Court in Brand X, and uh, the, the FCC. Uh, is desperately trying to find out what that is. Um, someone, uh, I, I worked in uh, Procter & Gamble, and my advertising agency came in and said, I have four great ideas for you. And my boss said, what you're telling me is you really don't have any one good idea. No. And on some level, the jurisdictional section of the order reads like that. We've got six, and someone said, 24 provisions that all get us there in different ways. And, this, and the answer is, they're, they're not really confident in any of them. They're pinning most of their hopes to 706, uh, to one particular provision. Uh, there are some pretty substantial arguments because they're talking about uh, the, the text of the, that statute itself says this is about stimulating investment in new uh, networks as opposed to going this direction. How that's going to work out with Chevron deference, I think, is anybody's guess. But I think that this is going to go on for a while. But um, the order reads to me like an, a commission, an agency that does not have tremendous confidence in this jurisdictional footing here. Yeah, I mean, the so... What will happen is once the federal, just mechanically, once this is noticed in the federal register, which hasn't happened yet, uh, there will be a number of suits that will be filed in various uh, uh, courts around the country. There will be some gamesmanship to get you know, into a, a, a venue that would be more, quote unquote, more friendly for whoever that particular uh, plaintiff is. So uh, in, you know, there's folks that feel like the DC circuit is not very friendly to the FCC. Maybe the Ninth Circuit might be more friendly, or the, the Third Circuit. So you'll see some of that. We'll find out where the where the venue will be, where where the lottery hits. It always seems to hit at the D.C. Circuit, but we'll we'll find out where that is. 
And then we'll see, I think, challenges to the authority. W one challenge will be the jurisdictional basis to see whether the FCC indeed is, is um, uh, acting lawfully under a theory of ancillary authority. The DC Circuit said that the FCC has to find statutory mandates, essentially mandates in the act that give it the authority to, to use the ancillary authority. And uh, if it's in a different, if it's in the DC circuit, that will be the standard. If it's in a different circuit, we may see a slightly different take on that. And then there'll be some arbitrary and capricious uh, arguments that certain aspects of the act were not uh, carefully considered enough. Those are very hard to, to, uh, to overcome. There'll be some folks that will say that, you know, treating uh, fixed wire line and, and, and wire line differently than mobile access is an arbitrary <coughs> distinction and that should be overturned. Uh, those kind of arguments have a, have a steep uh, uh, hill in front of them to overcome because there is more deference given to the agency. So I think we'll see both, uh, both of those actions taken on the, um, on the jurisdiction and some arbitrary and capricious uh, challenges. And I, I suspect also, I'm not sure how far they'll go and I'm sure how far they should go, but there will probably also be First and Fifth Amendment uh, challenges as well, uh, free speech and takings clause. Uh, those have been talked about as well. You know, I, I was really, the most disappointing thing I think about the final uh, report and order was the, the jurisdiction section that there was, uh, you know, they obviously had many months to, uh, to figure out how to get around Comcast. Uh, there, were, there were rumors that the, the FCC had come up with a brilliant new legal theory and, and uh, the chairman had made a speech uh, just a month before the, uh, the vote was taken saying you know, he had very smart lawyers who had figured something out and then you read the report and it's back to section 706. Uh, it's not exactly the same 706 argument that was made in the Comcast case and, re and rejected by the DC Circuit. The DC Circuit did kind of leave some room there to suggest an alternative way of pitching 706 and clearly the FCC took up the, the ball there. Uh, but the 706, as Professor Yu says, you know, it really uh, on its face is about removing regulatory obstacles to, to deploying more broadband. Uh, it, it seems, on, at least on its face, to be not the best way to hinge this entire thing. Again, I'm not sure that that wasn't uh, somewhat cynical on the part of the FCC, uh, not necessarily wanting this order to be uh, upheld by the courts. Well, um, so my understanding is that the FCC, uh, either last night or today or, or soon, will come out with um, their decision on the merger of NBC and, and Comcast. I was told, and I can't, I can't you know, verify this, that um, that there'll be a seven-year um, uh, ab abiding by the, the open internet order by Comcast um, with regard to uh, uh, openness. Now, let, uh, Professor, you started off by saying this thing's going to take the, the, law, the process is going to take six years. So let's say that the, the open internet order is stayed, uh, it's litigated for six years. Meanwhile, Comcast and NBC has to abide by the order alone. Um, is, is that fair? And I'd be shocked if, one, I don't think it's going to happen because I'd be shocked if it were stayed. You know, I think that it's a, there's a pretty high burden for it to be, for that to occur. Second, um, the 96 Act was a much bigger overhaul than this. That kind of thing does take six years. I don't expect this to take as long. I think that'll go more rightly. But, but Tim, your, your point is really uh, getting at something else, which is um, one of the problems of the merger review process which is uh, there's an even uh, classic example where a merging party agreed to comply with a reg that was eventually overturned to the court by the courts, but they were still governed by it. It's an illegal compliance. It was a cable national ownership cap, and they had to come back as like, since it's illegal, can you please let us go? And they, the commission actually said yes, but they were really bound by that. And one of the criticisms is they end up being single firm regulatory structures. We have precedent here, AT&T Bell South, we had a similar condition, Verizon MCI had a similar condition, SBC at and had a similar condition. Much shorter ones, but we'll have to wait and see. I suspect that if the, the regs go down, the FCC may let them off the hook. Yeah, I, I, think, I think I agree that the stay is, is probably hard, hard to get, but I think one of the benefits of this rule as it's in the courts, I think for all stakeholders probably, is this does impose some marketplace discipline on, on the ISPs. And, and even if there were a stay, I suspect that the other ISPs wouldn't rush to put in sort of servers to transform, uh, you know, to all of a sudden, you know, move into paid access uh, business models because, you know, the, the lawsuits could turn out differently and those pieces of equipment cost a lot of money and they're just not going to make those decisions. So I think there is a real marketplace discipline effect here that almost is more important in some ways than the text of some of, you know, the intricacies of how the rules are, are laid out. 
It, it probably really, in some sense, doesn't matter whether it's state or not because the, the, the proof here is all in the enforcement. Uh, and by going with a case-by-case -case adjudication <laughs> method for enforcement, the FCC in some ways said, you know, we're really going to figure out what these rules mean and how we're going to apply them uh, after the fact uh, when complaints are actually filed and, and when they get to the, the, the point of adjudication. This is, this is paragraphs 151 to 160. And in fact, if you look at the, the, uh, the, the framework that's laid out for how adjudication is going to happen, it's actually longer than the text of the rules themselves. Uh, it's a very long, formal, uh, almost a you know, sort of duplication in some sense of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure uh, in its key respects. So if the, you know, if the, if the rules are stay, or they're not stayed, but they go into effect, uh, but you know, the FCC can really decide uh, how much to enforce them or how strongly to enforce them uh, on the basis of when complaints are actually filed and you know, without actual complaints, without actual adjudications, the rules don't really make much difference anyway. Well, I think, uh, you know, again, looking at the long arc of um, uh, this debate, you know, first there were principles and people said we shouldn't operate a marketplace based upon high-minded principles, we need actual rules. So the commission did a full notice and comment rulemaking and put rules on the books. Then people said, well, you know what, um, after the Comcast case, whatever you do, don't do Title II. Uh, way too uh, onerous, it's, you know, overreaching and people, at the commission suggested, well, we'll do Title II, but instead of the 48 provisions of Title II, we'll just apply six. Uh, but even that was uh, too much. And so uh, going with what is probably more uh, direct uh, of a jurisdictional uh, invocation, uh, eschewing that, the commission instead does uh, Title I, and uh, uh, you know, predictably people will say, well, Title I, boy, that's flimsy. Uh, you don't want to do Title I. Uh, and then you're in a situation where, uh, you know, uh, looking at uh, net neutrality rules, people say, well, you know, it's a fleet-footed marketplace, technology is changing all the time. Don't do hundreds and hundreds of pages of uh, regulations. Uh, and so the commission doesn't. Uh, they do about a page and a half of uh, actual rules. And then, frankly, I think they did what you would want them to do, which is in the commentary of the order, they tried to give presumptive uh, guidance uh, in different scenarios and kind of give some guidance to the marketplace. I think that's the smart way to do it. I think viewing it on a case-by-case -case basis uh, allows the, the commission to keep abreast of changes in the, in the marketplace and changes in technology. I think the guidance, uh, frankly, is helpful. Uh, whenever you have a page and a half of actual rules, uh, you're going to have people come back and say, well, you didn't do hundreds of pages of regulations, you just did a page and a half, but the page and a half is really vague. Um, that's why the guidance is there, and I, think, and I think all of those things are helpful. So looking at how the debate has developed over time, I think you can see where the commission came out and why they came out that way. Obviously, uh, as we've mentioned before, the courts are going to look at this inevitably. Congress may look at it uh, as well. The, you know, a lot of folks on the House uh, side, the uh, Republican staff I know out in, uh, at CES mentioned a uh, talk about a resolution of disapproval. That's obviously the prerogative of Congress to, to do that. Uh, personally, I wish they would spend their uh, time on spectrum issues, on giving the FCC authority uh, for incentive auctions and addressing uh, those public safety issues. Uh, uh, head on. I wish they would uh, work in concert with the FCC in finally reforming uh, the Universal Service uh, Fund uh, and looking at that and overhauling that for the broadband era. Uh, they obviously have their um, uh, 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 issues with the order in, uh, in, in some quarters on, uh, on Capitol Hill. There will be supporters of it. Uh, the debate is fairly mature. Uh, and I think we'll go through this. Uh, uh, I think it's highly unlikely uh, that we'll see a resolution of disapproval pass the House and the Senate and get signed by President Obama. Uh, and so in the interim, what do we have? And I think you have to be careful when you talk about just getting rid of the rules uh, because and waiting for Congress to act. We have this whole regime right now coming from the 1992 Cable Act called retransmission consent. Uh, and you have cable companies and broadcasters and networks in the, in the marketplace that come to blows sometimes uh, and can't reach a commercial deal. Uh, consumers are hurt when the, when the uh, channel goes blank. Uh, and everybody says, well, the FCC should do something. And of course, 
Congress hasn't given the FCC uh, a role. As a matter of fact, Congress said to the FCC, you simply uh, are able to arbitrate whether or not they're engaging in good faith negotiations. But you can't otherwise you know, force the channel back on or protect consumers in any way. You don't want that to happen here uh, in a situation where the, the, uh, as, as important as the internet is to free enterprise, as important as the internet is to free expression, uh, having the commission handcuffed and unable uh, to uh, you know, play an important role to keep the internet free and open, I think would be uh, a big mistake. You know, as a, as a um, going back briefly to another uh, baseball metaphor, as, as a Red Sox fan, uh, I might not mind it personally uh, if this year they let the Red Sox pitchers call their own balls and strikes. Uh, but that's not good for the game. Uh, and ensuring that there's a level playing field ultimately for the close calls needs an ump. Uh, and that is really where the FCC has uh, set itself up, uh, I think, appropriately with a very light touch here uh, in this order. Well, I, I, I have five or 20 more questions to ask, but I, I, I took the microphone off not because I didn't want you to ask questions. Um, <laughs> I'm actually going to do a little Phil Donahue and bring it around to you. So I'm looking for questions from the audience. I'm sorry I didn't get to do all the questions I wanted to get through. Um, any questions? We love questions from the audience. Um, we love comments framed as a question from congressional staff. We do not tolerate uh, question, uh, comments framed as a question from anybody else. So um, <laughs> anybody, any questions? I'm sure there are. Yes, of course, of course, the back. Uh, Harold Fell with Public Knowledge. Uh, just a quick question, um, uh, I would say particularly for, for uh, Professor Yu, but uh, um, also for anybody on the panel, which is, um, I'm curious if you read the Department of Justice uh, statements, particularly the competitive impact statement, um, in yesterday's uh, uh, Comcast uh, merger, uh, which sets out uh, a uh, theory under the uh, antitrust, uh, you know, a straightforward Clayton Act analysis of why, particularly in the context of this merger, but also one could say more generally to ISPs that have similar incentives, um, why open internet rules are necessary. Uh, and uh, I would just um, ask, um, if you have uh, any response to, uh, to that analysis. Um, I didn't see that analysis. I, I've, heard, I've seen the press reports of where it's going, so assuming that I understand it properly, I finally find it surprising. Um, when I was invited to testify in front of the Senate Commerce Committee, I did what a classic antitrust lawyer would do, is I ran the merger guidelines against the, the markets, and it suggested that it was the kind of merger that would be completely unproblematic. And so what we're seeing is a, a fairly actually, the only thing that we're really concerned about in the, the revolutionary part of the Comcast merger is online video and actually requiring Comcast to release products they never designed before and creating program access rules for internet content as well as cable and television content, which is a pretty revolutionary thing for them to do. And that's, a, 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 I'm just frankly surprised to see that. If you look at the structure of the, uh, the video distribution market right now, uh, it does not fall within the guidelines of what the mergers, guide, the, what the merger guidelines suggest raise anti-competitive concerns. The merger guidelines are not enforceable. They don't create rights. It's clearly their prerogative to try to do that. Uh, but what I see is is a fairly competitive, diffuse market there uh, that um, it's hard to see justified under traditional antitrust principles how they came out that way. Uh, you know, it's not I haven't read it, Harold, but I, it's not surprising they would ground that uh, that justice would ground uh, their their actions in that because that's their their jurisdiction. But what I thought was really interesting about the FCC rule is it rejected competition theory as a basis for having prophylactic rules. Uh, paragraph 32 says, although these threats to internet enabled innovation, growth, and competition do not depend on broadband providers having market power with respect to end users, instead, what the FCC where the FCC grounded their rules is in the terminating access monopoly of each broadband provider. So it doesn't matter, if, according to the FCC's theory, whether there's two providers, six providers, 12 providers, 14 providers, um, that that kind of competition analysis wasn't the reason the FCC <coughs> established the rules. Instead, they, they focused on the terminating access monopoly, which we argued for in our, in our various comments. And if you think about that, every application provider is dealing with their own monopoly. Whoever a user picks as their ISP, 
is the ISP that that application provider is going to have to deal with, uh, and they don't have any choice. They can't switch to another ISP. The, the application provider can't. Yeah, I can't resist jumping in. The, the one um, thing that's interesting about the terminating access monopoly is that even if there's competition in the last mile, you can have competitive problems. And people talk about this constantly. The one thing that, I, I'll, I'll just leave it at this because it's very technical, but whether that's a problem actually depends on the pricing regime in the network. It is not a general problem that always is there. And so you can't just say, oh, terminating access monopoly, therefore we regulate. It actually requires a good deal more analysis to find out is the pricing relationships in this distribution channel the kind that tend to give those problems? Because uh, for things like bill and keep and peering, they go away. And so a lot of it, you know, some of the regulatory moves that we make can actually alleviate those problems independent of mandating access. I did my own analysis um, uh, because I'm a happy uh, Fios uh, subscriber. And uh, I love the service. Uh, it brings uh, wonderful speeds uh, to um, my home office um, international headquarters. But um, <laughs> I do know that when I signed up for Files and, um, uh, and uh, you know, signed up again for uh, another term with them, that my uh, early termination fee was quite high. Um, I think it was somewhere between uh, $350 and $400 high. And so from the standpoint of whether or not uh, you know, there's a terminating access monopoly, theoretically, I have competition from the wire across the street, and I can switch. As a practical matter, my ability to switch is not easy. Uh, and I think that, that there is a reality to that that I think uh, you know, many consumers will face. And that's why I think you know, when we get to a point where there are 14 uh, competitors, um, when we have sort of the restoration of the, of the Telecom Act as uh, intended, and there are 14 you know, alternatives, uh, then you can revisit uh, uh, you know, uh, these rules. But I think as a practical matter going forward, and this is highlighted in the broadband plan, uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future, we will have, uh, in most parts of the country on the wireline, two providers. Um, and in many respects, going forward, for high-speed access, you may only really have one. And I think that's also important to note. Well, and also, Chris, and this will be litigated, but the FCC in paragraphs 24 through 26 do cite economic studies as a basis for their terminating access monopoly uh, theory, uh, they, especially the Banshevik uh, analysis and the Economides analysis. So, you know, courts will look to see whether that was sufficient, but the FCC does ground their theory in, um, in, in site to economic studies that were part of the docket. It's part of the docket, but those studies are complicated in ways, but I'm not going to get into that. The one thing I will say is, if I'm remembering correctly, file, uh, Verizon just announced that they are abandoning all early, uh, early termination fees for files. So for whatever, I mean, there seems to be, and primarily because of their, Comcast is uh, successfully uh, marketing against them. And so there has been some market discipline where they've actually let that go. Other questions? Well, I, I, I have a question on the wireless front. Oh, we have one down there? Yeah, it's one back. Oh. Mr. Bender. Thanks. I'm Adam Bender with ComDaily. Uh, it's been mentioned that the resolution of disapproval uh, would be unlikely to make it past the president. So I was just hoping to get the uh, panelists' opinions on uh, why they're going ahead and doing it if it seems like it's not going to go all the way through. Yeah, I would be the wrong person to ask why, um, uh, why they're proceeding with it. Um, Venture, I guess. <laughs> it's good politics. You know, I mean, uh, the, the president himself has announced a review of rules to try to make it easier on business. Uh, the thing about creating jobs right now is in the air about lifting restrictions on uh, industries of all kinds. I doubt it'll apply to this one, given that it was Obama campaign promise mm -hmm. and that it's just unlikely to expand. But in that sense, saying uh, you're, they're make, uh, uh, a legislator is making a record for their constituents that they are opposed to these kinds of regulations. And it's ultimately not about whether the, uh, the, rule is, the effort is going to succeed or not. It's about communicating a political stance to constituents. I, I think that law, has the, 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 this resolution law has been in effect for like 15 years or something like that. But it's only been successfully used once. It was up in ergonomic standards. It's very hard to get through, uh, even though there's expedited processes to get through both bodies and be signed by the president. So, but I think you know the the policymakers will have, in addition to this resolution, the vote. They'll they'll have hearings on this rule, and I think those hearings probably will be helpful in illuminating where the different fault lines are uh, with the rules. 
Well, let's imagine that things are different in the Senate. Let's imagine that you know, the GOP controlled the Senate um, and something got through and something got through um, uh, Senate Commerce and ultimately maybe was attached to a larger package, something very important. Um, do you think that President Obama would veto something, you know, a, a, a provision uh, deauthorizing the FCC or something else like that? Um, uh, do you think he'd fall on his sword on net neutrality? I, well, I think the resolution has to be a standalone vote. I, I don't think it can be attached. No, he's to talking about a different, oh, a, 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 a different right. vehicle. Okay. A different vehicle. Well, it depends on what else he's, you know, interested in horse trading about at the time. I mean, if you know, if just the, the the tax cuts, health care versus the stimulus, whatever. Obviously, the you know decisions get made on anything have to do with the context of what else is going on in Congress uh, at that time, and you know it, it may be a bargaining chip for somebody uh, that they either do or don't want to spend. I think by the time we get to the later uh, spring and summer, uh, I think people will be looking over their shoulders at a December uh, FCC order that more likely than not will already be in court uh, in some venue and decide that uh, addressing deficits, uh, raising the debt ceiling, uh, dealing with uh, uh, raising revenue uh, for a budget bill, you know, from spectrum auctions, incentive auctions, those sorts of issues. Uh, the commission uh, next month is teeing up uh, reform of uh, universal service uh, and intercarrier compensation. I think those issues start to take front and center, um, and I think that, uh, frankly, when they do, uh, it, it, it would be um, most welcome. Yeah, hi, good morning. It seems, to quote Yogi Berra, uh, deja vu all over again in terms of the unbundling rules that were in place several years, and one of the statistics that I found astounding that I recently saw is that within the next three to five years, the majority of people are gonna be accessing the internet via their handheld devices. And I'm just wondering, as this kind of litigation plays out, it, it seems that it's gonna be obsolete in terms of access to the internet. And I'm just wondering, in that environment where the majority of people are accessing the internet via their handheld devices, what does a kind of open access framework look like? What, you know, what are those arguments that would emerge from, from that kind of um, environment? I think the trends are clear. I mean, I, I saw that like over 80% of messages sent now or 90 are wireless device messages of mostly text, which isn't IP, it's not internet based at all, but I mean, that is coming. The wireless world is obviously much more competitive because of spectrum, because you don't have to sink costs in, that aren't recoverable any other way. You can actually uh, get out of it. it the, the, it's what an, an, an economist would call a contestable market. It, it's completely very, very different. What you're getting at, though, is interesting. A lot of the Internet's architecture was designed for a web-based world and the email-based world, which is about file transfers through a telephone line. And if you actually read the engineering literature, they go through a litany of things that the Internet doesn't do well. Number one on the list is mobility. Another one is multi, uh, multi mass media, like video. Another one is security, which is something that's very important. Another is multi-homing, that is having multiple connections to the same device, because the internet thinks that there's only one path to get to any one device. Another one, and, and there's a whole literature that says, the internet's getting creaky, and if you listen to the laundry list I just said, those are the things that weren't that important in 95, when it was all web browsing and phone, and phone lines, that have become mission critical for the future applications today. And right now there's a vibrant debate going on in the engineering community about what to do. And so this is an area where, my take on this is where all that's still up for grabs, policymakers have to tread very, very lightly because uh, by omission they could actually say something that, without intending to, a certain turn of phrase that ends up controlling the path of an industry when we don't know what the optimal design really is. I agree that policymakers have to tread lightly and carefully because you don't want to stifle innovation uh, unintentionally. But I think the, the distinction between uh, wireline and wireless are, they're going to blur. We're not just going to have handheld wireless, but we're going to have wireless that are bigger than handheld, you know, tablets and other things. And what we wouldn't want to see is sort of that close, the open system that's on the wire line uh, not move to those, the bigger wireless uh, platforms, but instead we want to see that open, and we don't want to see the more closed system of the small handhelds move into the bigger devices. So I think the FCC is saying here the trend is toward openness. We're not sure whether today most people access applications through their app stores on their wireless platforms. In several years, that might change. We might be accessing the web uh, through your browser. You might be getting applications through the new HTML standards that work through your, through your browser rather than through downloading a separate application, a cloud-based application. So I think all of that is, is likely to change in some degree. I think these rules uh, have a lot of flexibility 
uh, in that regard. And, uh, but the important thing is the FCC said transparency is gonna apply to these wireless networks, which I think is important, and that, uh, and that they've established a no blocking standard. And they said they're gonna continue to, to monitor this market and hold back and preserve their ability to regulate further if they see uh, uh, abuses by uh, the wireless provider. So I think there is, you know, we have to see how it develops and policymakers wanna tread carefully. But um, I think you're going to see the distinction between all of these uh, platforms blur in a significant way. Larry, then yeah. Connor's yeah, has last word. So I, mean, th I think to me this actually gets to the core of what's wrong with the process of trying to regulate a technology that's changing as quickly uh, as internet technology ours. If you, if you go through the report, so obviously Adobe helped me on this, but you will find the word traditionally 25 times, historically 9 times, and typically 21 times. Uh, and if you go through the, the whole list of exceptions and limitations, I think what you realize is, you know, the FCC started out, like many of us, very nostalgic for the Internet of the 1990s. I mean, in the 1990s, I was much thinner, much richer, and much younger than I am now. So I, you know, I sympathize very much with this nostalgia. But the truth is that the Internet of today is not the Internet of 1990s. And the sense that we were all, you know, sort of sitting around at Esalen naked talking about uh, changing the world back then, um, the, the frontier aspect of this is gone. If you start to, there were, you know, I counted over 15 major exceptions that were added to or in some ways uh, changed from the original order. You've got things like uh, content delivery networks, peering, caching, BPN, specialized services, coffee shops, ebook readers, uh, quality of service applications, uh, app stores, and so on. All of these are now given so special kinds of exceptions from some or all of the rules, in addition, of course, to mobile, which is uh, changing the fastest. And, you know, that's fine. I think actually, of course, some people that was what they disliked most about the rules. These are essential exceptions because the reality is the Internet is much more complicated than it was. It's not open. It's not neutral. And it's not a level playing field. And it shouldn't be. Uh, it's the reason that it works so well today is because engineers and, and aftermarket service providers have created these different ways of optimizing or prioritizing the kind of content, video, games, and audio that need different kinds of service and that we see the most often or that we use the most often. The problem here is that the, what the FCC is they put a stake in the ground and said, all right, this list of exceptions and no others unless we decide others are allowed. So things like paid priority, it's disfavored, but it hasn't been banned. Uh, there's just an arbitrary, you know, this is 2010, this is sort of an arbitrary list of things because that was the list of things that are traditional or typical or historic in the last 10 years. Well, we've got another 10 years of this kind of engineering that's going to go on, and we may have to come back every time to the FCC and say, is this one okay, is this one okay, is this one okay, is this one okay? Obviously, that can uh, can slow the, the, the pace with which this remarkable change Although, happened. I think, Larry, the FCC sort of understood that and accounted for that as they said they're going to have a review of all of these rules within two years and a report to Congress. Well, two so years I think the FCC is a is long time in Internet. It is, but it's, you know, it's too it's, long. It's, it's, it's shorter than 10 years. Well, let me let me let Colin have the last word. Um, thank you. Um, you know, obviously, the the commission did not extend all of the rules to uh, wireless, and I think uh, you know that was greeted with uh, disappointment in some quarters and relief in others. Um, I think, as you look long term, uh, I think the the trends, as you know, Professor Yu uh, outlined, are are obvious that more and more people uh, for uh, work and for their personal life are going to be relying on uh, wireless uh, services and and wireless, you know, computational devices, whatever they may become. I think that over time, uh, that when you look at you know the devices and the the you know the the mores in the marketplace by uh, through which uh, you know people use these devices and these services, if I have you know my my device and I plug it into a phone jack and it has certain rules and I have certain rights and entrepreneurs have certain uh, uh, opportunities uh, uh, through that device because it's plugged into the to the phone network, uh, and then I unplug the phone jack from the device and instead use it in a, in a mobile context with a wireless provider and I suddenly lose uh, those protections or those rules as, a, as an entrepreneur or a user or uh, I, I think that would uh, that'll be strange to people I think that leads to some disequilibrium in the marketplace I, I think frankly that leads to greater uncertainty long term about uh, what marketplace participants can rely on and so uh, you know, the Commission has basically uh, uh, put in place, uh, you know, a couple of key uh, rules in this uh, area. We'll monitor that marketplace, see the development of it, 
Um, but reasonable network management applies regardless. And I think, you know, for whatever engineering uh, issues that uh, will arise, they can be um, uh, encompassed uh, in that. But I don't think you want to see the balkanization of internet uh, uh, service uh, to users in, in such a way where you have different rules depending upon which device or which provider you happen to be using at a particular point in the day. And I think, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, my own private Idaho was a great B-52 song, um, but you don't want that to be the way the internet works. Uh, and so making sure that we had, as Markham said earlier in the discussion, one internet and looking at it that way and continuing to look at, uh, at it that way will be important in the long term. Thank you. And, and uh, it's a crime that this panel only has an hour to discuss. I'm sorry we didn't get to even half of what we should be getting to. But I promised Gar Gary, Gary Ireland we'd start on time. Um, we have a panel next, and they have about 13 seconds to get up here and start talking. So thank you to all of you. Thank, thank you very much. Well,